Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this video blog. Uh, I'm going to tell a Bob Jones story. We get uh, requests quite often from people who uh, want me to share more about Bob Jones and some of the things that went on. And I'm going to share a couple of things here that were pretty, pretty amazing, pretty fascinating stuff. But they speak directly to um, the messages I've shared in the last two blogs. The one we called Redeeming the Time and the other called Principles uh, of the second time. <clears throat> and uh, it has to do with, you know, getting another opportunity. The Lord giving us another shot at doing some things that maybe we didn't get right as a people group the first time. Um, I met Bob in, just as a brief little history, I met Bob in 1994, May of 1994, uh, based on a vision Bobby Connor had that, um, that we were to do a conference with Bob Jones. And, so we ended up doing that in Bobby's church, First Baptist Church of Bullard, Texas. And by June of 1994, Bob calls me up and says, he informs me that he's coming to my house. <laughs> so he and Viola came over June of 1994 and spent the weekend. And we developed a friendship um, that lasted until he died. But, but for the next 14 years, we were you know, very much involved. <clears throat> Uh, by, the, by the fall of 1994, he had asked me to write the first Shepherd's Rod. And I wrote 14 years worth, but that was the first year. And, and uh, we were getting together quite often. And so by early 1995, <clears throat> Rick Joyner uh, hosted his first prophetic roundtable at Moravian Falls. And so we all met there. Bobby Connor uh, and Carolyn and, of course, us and... Bob and Viola and Paul Kane and a few other people had our first prophetic roundtable meeting at Moravian Falls. Uh, before Moravian Falls was really well known at that time, it was just kind of newly on the map, a newly constructed lodge that had been built by Harry and Louise Bazell. And shortly after we had this uh, prophetic roundtable meeting in January of 1995, I get a phone call from Bob sometime in the early part. First quarter, I wish I had written the date down, but all I, the first quarter of 1995, I get a phone call from Bob Jones, and he said, I just had a vision. I said, what, what of? He said, I saw two hurricanes coming, and they hit the same spot. And I said, really, where? He said, your house. <laughs> and I said, my house? He said, yeah. He said, I saw two hurricanes coming, and both of them passing over right where you live. I said, well, Bob, I don't think I like that prophecy. He said, well, I saw it. And he said, the first storm will be a sign of what the Lord's going to do. The second storm will be a sign of what the enemy is going to do. Without going into too much detail and spending too much time on this blog, it happened. August of that year, August of 1995, uh, while we were actually having a meeting at my home with Rick and Bobby and Bob and myself, Hurricane Aaron enters the, the Gulf of Mexico, E-R-I-N, which is a Hebrew word meaning watcher or watchful. And it enters the Gulf of Mexico, and literally, the eye of the storm passes directly over our home. Pretty amazing. 61 days later, 61 days later, Hurricane Opal comes from the west, moving east, and literally, the eye of the storm passes directly over our home. I'll try to hold these pictures up just to give you a, an, an image of it, but I think Caleb is going to try to put the graphics up. But here you see the two storms literally hitting the exact same spot 61 days apart. Meteorologists back then said that two storms hitting the same spot in a century would be astronomical, much less two that hit the same spot within 61 days of one another. Nobody could have predicted that except God. Only God knew that. So I knew something was up. I knew that we were entering a season of prophetic revelation. Eight days after Aaron hit on August the 3rd, uh, the White Dove came to our balcony, and that's why we named our ministry White Dove Ministries. So by the fall of 1995, we were getting a lot of revelation. <clears throat> sometime, around, um, sometime around the Day of Atonement, I don't have the exact date, but I was in the process of writing the Shepherd's Rod for that year. Sometime around the Day of Atonement, 1995, I get a phone call from Bob, and he said, I've had a vision. <laughs> and by now, he's got my attention. I said, what did you see? He said, well, it's unusual, and I thought maybe you could help me. I said, what was it? Well, I said, well, he said, well, he said, I saw the date January 16th, and I know it's important. January 16th is important. Do you understand what it means? And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. 
I said, uh, you know, I, I was a student. I listened to a lot of William Branham revelations, and I knew that on January 16, 1956, William Branham stood up in Chicago, Illinois, and made an announcement that America had missed an opportunity, that God poured His Spirit out with great power, that there was an opportunity to enter into a place of promise, the promised land, if you will. Well, that generation could have entered into some of the things that are promised for the last days. And unfortunately, the people, uh, as John G. Lake had said in his generation, were more captivated by the phenomena of God than the person of God. And the opportunity was lost in John G. Lake's day, and it was lost again. Not the revival completely, uh, just an opportunity. Just like it was with Israel when they came to Kadesh Barnea. They had a chance to cross over, but the people wouldn't. And so they had to go back into the wilderness and a new generation was born and they come back to Kadesh Barnea. So he gives me this date. We call up Rick and say, Rick, we feel like we're supposed to meet on January 16th this year because January 16th, 1996 will be 40 years to the day since this announcement was made in Chicago when you know, Bob got it in a vision so there must be something up. There must be something significant about it. So Rick holds his meeting that day, January 16th, 1996. And we drive up. I, <laughs> I actually got a phone call from Bob on January 10th, 1996. He had another vision. <laughs> and in it, he saw uh, two men that were going to attend the meeting. It's a long vision. Maybe I'll tell the whole thing one day. It was called the teller line vision where he saw the Lord operating. You know, he saw his things allegorical symbolic and he saw the Lord as if he was a bank teller <laughs> and he had awarded golden wings to someone and was giving them a check to be written on heaven which a golden wings in that in that in instance was not necessarily related to soaring in the spirit but it was like a commissioning like a commissioned officer receiving golden wings and writing a check on heaven means that God puts a deposit of his spirit he puts a realm of authority on someone and they can draw on heaven's resources for healing and for deliverance and for salvation and so on. So we had this vision where he said, uh, two men are going to be coming to the meeting uh, on January 16th, and we can't really start the meeting until those two men show up. So I say, Bob, who are these two men? He said, I don't know. I said, where are they coming from? He said, I don't know. I said, Bob, you do know this is an invitation-only meeting. <laughs> you know, Rick's only sending out invitations to certain people. He said, all I know is two men are going to show up, and when they do, we can start the meeting. So we drive up, you know, I pick Bob up and 14 hour drive to Moravian Falls. All the way up, he talked about these two men that have got to come to the meeting. So we finally get there, you know, and on the morning of January 16th, 1996, we start in the meeting and of course, Bob says, you know, two men have got to come to this meeting before we can really do what the Lord wants us to do. And Rick says, well, Bob, who are they? He said, I don't know. And he said, where are they coming from? I don't know. When are they going to get here? I don't know. I just know two men are coming. This is a true story. I'm telling you just the way it happened. And so we're kind of, you know, a little bit in the dark. And Rick says, you do know this is an invitation-only meeting. Moravian Falls was kind of an isolated place at that time. You know, not a lot of people were just traveling through. But, you know, Paul Kane was there, and Bobby and Carolyn were there, and Mahesh and Bani Shavda, and Rick's staff, and myself, and, and, and Wanda, and just a number of other people like that. And so we start the meeting that morning, the morning of January 16th, knowing that two men had to show up, but we didn't know who they were or where they were coming from. Not too much went on that morning. And so we broke for lunch, and we come back that afternoon, starting the meeting. And uh, Rick just says, Paul Keith, just share the whole January 16th thing. So that afternoon, I just began to share with a group. In fact, here is a picture <laughs> of that meeting, of me just before I was sharing that. I remember sitting on this uh, fireplace, you know, and there you see Bob and you see Bobby Connor. But uh, so I just began to share it with the group. You know, Bob had called and he had this date, January 16th, and, and I knew the significance, significance of it was that it was 40 years to the day since an opportunity had been lost in the prior generation. And so we're here today on the anniversary of that meeting. And literally, this is the truth, literally while I'm telling the story, the door opens to the lodge and two men walk in. Bob says, there they are. <laughs> the two men he had been waiting for for days. And they walk in. One of them was a man by the name of Erskine Holt. The other was a man by the name of Ray Kershke. And this is where it gets really interesting. 
So they sit down and uh, I rehearse the story all over again, just telling them the same thing I'm just sharing with you now. We're here because, you know, Bob had this vision that something was significant about January 16th, 1996. It was 40 years to the day, I said, when a prophet stood up in Chicago, Illinois, and had announced that his generation, that generation who had experienced great outpourings of the Spirit, tremendous miracles, great healing meetings, multitudes of people were healed out of wheelchairs, the whole thing, mass salvations of people that were going on during that time, filling the biggest buildings in America, the biggest coliseums in America, were being filled with people, and uh, the opportunity was lost. And when I said that on January 16, 1956, the prophet stood up and said an opportunity was lost, one of the two men, Ray Kirschke, raised his hand and said, I was in that meeting. I was in that meeting. And we were stunned. We were stunned. He said, I, he said, I was the last disciple of John G. Lake. <clears throat> Ray Kirschke was 16 years old when he went on staff for John G. Lake as a worship leader and as a youth leader. <clears throat> he told us that day that he was the last person that John G. Lake discipled. <laughs> and he said he had done meetings and seen miracles. And he said, I'd always wanted to, to hear William Branham. He said, that was the only meeting I ever attended. It was, he said, I happened to be in Chicago. He happened to be speaking and I went to the meeting and I heard him say those words. And just think about that for just a minute, <laughs> you know. Here we are in a remote cabin of North Carolina, meeting with a group of prophetic people at a place that's isolated. And we're talking about something that happened 40 years ago that day. And these two men happened to walk into our lodge on that very day. And one of the two men was in the meeting in 1956. The story was that they had started a missionary journey, driving up from Florida up the East Coast all the way to New York visiting churches along the way and uh, had turned around and were on their way back down to Florida and just on a whim decided to stop by Moravian Falls to see what was going on, walk into our meeting and become participants in it. So for me, that was an amazing affirmation. Only God could have pulled that off. I sat down with Ray, Ray Kershke that night. I knew that I would have to tell the story and would have to write it probably in an article, which I've done. And uh, so I sat down, he was in a chair and the chair had a footstool. And so I, I sat down next to him and I said, I, I'm gonna have to tell this story. So I, I wanna make sure, <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to just reassure me, you're positive you were in that meeting. He said, I'll never forget it. He said, he said it, was one of the only, it was the only time I heard William Branham. And he said, I felt a shift in the spirit that night. That's what he talked about. He felt a shift in the spirit and here it was, you know, the Lord orchestrated for that very man to be in our meeting. He died in 2012 at the age of 93. So here's what I believe that means. <clears throat> I have to admit, I have to admit, I felt like that was so significant. I felt like we would be in latter rain type revivals right away. I did. You know, sometimes we try to put our interpretation to things and that's when we get in trouble. But, but when I look back now, over those last 20 years, I realized that there has been a huge change, that something did shift, no doubt about it. We are preaching things today that were not being preached prior to 1996. We're preaching truth today over the last 20 years that the generation of the 50s and 60s were persecuted for preaching. They were ostracized for preaching about sonship, for preaching about manifestation of the sons of God. I realized some of that got off off base a little bit back then. But, but we, I believe, have been presenting it on a, in a balanced way, what it means to be at the manifestation of the sons of God. The bride of Christ without spot or wrinkle. The invisible union of the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride. Walking in a place of, of unity, of union with God, experiences with God, the different things that we talk about today that were not part of the vernacular, the common vernacular on a broad basis before 1996. So we, I believe, have laid a foundation. But I have to be honest, I am still believing. In fact, I know, I don't just believe it, I know that we are going to experience meetings like they had in the 1940s and 50s. It's going to happen. 
you might say, well, we've had some great things happen. We have. We had the charismatic renewal. We had um, the awakening of the prophetic ministries. We had the awakening of the apostolic ministries. Those are wonderful things. But we're still not having meetings where the whole altar area is filled with cots and gurneys and wheelchairs because people are there with the expectation that God's going to show up and people are going to get out of the wheelchairs in a mass way. That's what I'm after. I think one of the tokens of what I'm looking for, of what I'm believing for, was the meeting that A.A. A. Allen had in 1959 right here in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. 3,000 people filled the National Guard Armory. And a little lady brings her terminally ill little boy. 26 major illnesses. No eyes, no feet. Every organ was malfunctioning. The list of things that was wrong with him was staggering. And A. A. Allen took that little boy in his arms and began to walk back and forth. And I have personally spoken with two people that with their eyes watched as eyeballs were fashioned in that little boy's eyes, as feet were fashioned on the end of his legs. One of them was R. W. Shambach. He tells the story, we have a video clip on our YouTube channel, the White Dove Ministries YouTube channel, where he tells the testimony. He was a, the worship leader for A.A. A. Allen. And after that miracle happened, Mama Horn was the other witness who went home to be with the Lord this very week, a beautiful, precious lady, woman of God, she loved me and uh, communicated with me. She, was, she went home this week to be with the Lord at the age of 90. But she was a witness of that miracle. And A. Allen bounced back and forth holding that little baby and all of a sudden 26 miracles happened right in the very, in the eyes of every person there. And R. W. Shambach said, everybody in the building was healed. Everybody in the building was healed. The entire altar was covered with medical paraphernalia, wheelchairs, crutches, hearing aids, back braces, everything you can imagine, the entire altar was covered. Some people left cigarettes and stuff. They were delivered of, of addictions and whatever. The whole altar was covered with all of this paraphernalia where all the people, everybody there that needed a miracle got it in one meeting. Now that's what I'm holding out for. It's not just about the miraculous. We want to see the miraculous. It's about visitation. It's about us as a generation, I hope, not being so captivated by the phenomena of God, but more so by the person of God. Yes, we need miracles. The miracles are for the lost. The miracles, of course, we, we need them too to get well. But I mean, the, the miraculous is for evangelism as a, as a main focus. So people can see that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I've been sharing these blogs about it's time, it's time, it's time. And in my heart, I'm hoping and praying it's time for us to begin to have those kinds of meetings again. You know, uh, we had a meeting later on with, Ursh, with uh, Ray Kershke, I should say who was from Spokane, Washington, where he symbolically passed the torch, if you will, like a Joshua and a Caleb would have done from one generation to the next, where we can hopefully and prayerfully begin to steward the kind of power that they did in the prior generation, but in this generation, getting it right, doing so with humility, doing so with the right perspective, without selfish ambition, without wrong motives, but with a pure heart to see to it the Lord Jesus receives the full measure of His reward. So I believe Bob's visions were significant. I was there. I was an eyewitness of that. Nobody can predict two hurricanes and they hit the same spot. Nobody can say two men are coming in and one of those men happened to be in the meeting that happened in 1956 and there we were 40 days later. That was God. That was God just giving us a little nudge, a little encouragement that he's still got this thing under control. He's going to have his revival. He's going to have his harvest. I heard the Lord one time say, I will have my harvest. That's just the way he said it. I will have my harvest. And he will. He will have it. One way or the other, he will have his harvest. And I hope and pray that 2017, we begin to see some stuff. I do. I'm holding out for that. I'm holding out for the for the big stuff, you know. 
that, that we can start having those kinds of meetings where the glory comes and people are healed, delivered, and set free. And to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified. That's my heart, and I know it's yours as well. So I hope you've enjoyed the little Bob Jones story. I hope it's an encouragement, but it's an affirmation. It's an affirmation that God's going to visit us a second time. We're back at Kadesh Barnea, and let's cross over this time and get it right. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.